it's great to be uh, great to be with you. The passage of scripture we're looking at this morning is Psalm 27. So if you have uh, a Bible or a, a device or you've memorized scripture, just bring that passage uh, to mind uh, as we read it uh, together. Psalm uh, 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not hand me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. This is God's word. Uh, Before we uh, look at that passage together, let's uh, turn to the Lord again in prayer. Our Father, you are our light and our salvation. And so as we uh, look at your word now, uh, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you uh, would help us to see uh, the true light uh, that has come into the world. Uh, Help us to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And in doing so, that our hearts uh, would be uh, drawn to him, lifted up uh, and changed uh, to be more like him. Uh, For we ask it in his name. Amen. One of the big themes of the last 18, 15 months or so uh, has been fear. We've been afraid uh, like never before. Uh, Things that we used to think had no uh, danger attached to them at all, uh, like shaking one another's hands or uh, even leaving the house, uh, we have all at one time or another uh, laid aside. Uh, because uh, we've been told they're too risky. And for an increasing number of people, uh, as this uh, crisis has unfolded, uh, fear has become a debilitating part of life. Numerous studies have have reported that the effect of everything that's gone on is to dramatically increase uh, the rates of anxiety uh, in the population. Perhaps... Uh, This morning, you are in the grip of that kind of anxiety. Perhaps you know what it's like uh, to live uh, with fear. The kind of fear that is paralyzing. A fear that that soaks uh, into your bones. A fear that hangs heavy over the horizon of your life uh, like a dark storm. Perhaps you're... Uh, fearful of of catching the virus. Perhaps you're fearful that 
the, the lifting of restrictions will mean that you or, or someone you love uh, becomes sick and ill. Perhaps you're fearful that, that things will never get back to normal, uh, that this uh, crisis will go on and on and on uh, without uh, any end. Or, or perhaps you're fearful for some completely uh, unconnected reason. But one thing we've realized, one thing we've seen, is that fear is easily created, but very hard to to dispel. And so where, in times like these, do we find an antidote to fear? Well, here in uh, Psalm 27, uh, David, the psalmist, uh, claims to have found it. And he says in verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Now maybe you say, well, is it David? uh, What did he have to fear? He didn't have coronavirus. He didn't have uh, the lockdown. Well, David was the ancient king of Israel who faced enemies both within and without uh, his nation. Even his own son uh, would turn against him. His reign began and ended in civil war. And yet he says in verse 1, Whom shall I fear? Why is that? Why is it that David is able to speak so confidently? Well, verses 1 to 3 are are, are simply a defiant affirmation that he will fear no one. Look at verse 3. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Even in the worst circumstances, David says, I will not fear. So the question is, why? Why is David so free of fear? And as we've said, it's, well, as we've said, it's because the Lord is his light and his salvation. The Lord is his stronghold of his life. But we all know people who believe in God. Who, who seem to express trust in God, and yet, even, as they, even if they work for God, their lives are crippled by fear and anxiety. Why is it that for David, his belief in God removes his fear, when for so many of us, it seems to barely make a difference? Well, we get the answer in uh, verse 4. And David says this, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. You see, verse 4 is the explanation for verses 1 to 3. It's because of verse 4 that David is free from fear. And it's because David is able to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. It's this beauty which is the antidote to fear. That's our first heading this morning. The place of beauty is the place of safety. The place of beauty is the place of safety. See, beauty is uh, compelling. We're all drawn in one form or another to a beauty. What is beauty? Well, beauty is something that we desire, not because it's useful, not because it gets us something else, but simply for what it is. And all our hopes and dreams, all our longings and our yearnings are built on a glimpse of beauty, a a hope that we will gain the beauty that we desire. Perhaps uh, during those those long months of, of lockdown, you were sustaining yourself with a, with a picture of what life would be uh, when uh, the f- more uh, freedom came. The hug from your uh, grandchildren, the, the family round at the meal t- table, uh, that uh, foreign holiday, a picture uh, of beauty. Something that we seek not as a means to an end, but as an end in itself. And David is saying here, the one thing I want, the beauty that I seek, is to see the beauty of the Lord. I wonder, do you think of God 
as useful. I think if we're honest, uh, we'd have to say that it doesn't come naturally to us. We might say that God is true. We, we might say that he's, a, he's a, a rescuer, a savior. But is he beautiful? I remember speaking to a friend who, who felt spiritually dry. And as he talked about his understanding of Christianity and the Christian message, uh, his understanding was that one day God was going to judge the world, God's justice was going to come, and it would, it would kind of devastate the world uh, like a nuclear bomb falling upon it. But because of, of Jesus, because of Christianity, there was a, there was a, a, a kind of shelter a bit like a, a nuclear bunker uh, that you could get into. And his job in, as he uh, lived his life amongst his friends was to tell people, get in the bunker with me. Get in the nuclear bunker with me uh, and with uh, Jesus. And he was uh, frustrated and disappointed by how few people seemed to respond to that message, to get in the bunker with me. Of course, the the Christian message is that Jesus will keep us safe in the the day of God's judgment. But in my friend's mind, in his thinking, where was all the the life, the light, the joy, the beauty? It was outside with his uh, friends. He was in a a cold, dark, dank place while his friends pursued their dreams outside in in the bomb shelter. As I was reflecting on his view, it reminded me of one of my favorite stories in church history, which is of um, uh, Martin Luther's wife. Uh, Martin Luther, the great German reformer, uh, sparked the the Reformation. Uh, And as the Reformation uh, spread through Germany, many people who were monks and nuns decided to leave their their vocations behind and and, um, uh, and embrace uh, the truths that Martin Luther had decided. And one of those was was the lady who would become Martin Luther's wife, who was a nun. Um, but, for, but she couldn't just leave uh, along with other, others who she was with who were, uh, wanted to make the same choice. And so what they had to do was um, find a merchant who sold herring uh, to the, the convent that they were in. Uh, and uh, Katerina, who is uh, Katerina von Borsa uh, and, her, and her cohort, uh, got into the, the, her- the empty herring barrels and were then smuggled out uh, into Wittenberg. Uh, And when they were uh, let out of the herring barrels, uh, they all found uh, willing uh, husbands uh, in Wittenberg. And I think for a lot of us, that is how a Christianity can seem. Getting into a a, a herring barrel, pretty stinky, uh, pretty dark, uh, but eventually after a pretty bumpy ride, uh, you'll get somewhere a bit better and a bit safer. And it's no wonder that that a life like that feels pretty unattractive. Would you like to get into the fish barrel? It's not a message uh, that many of us would respond to. But for David, what his life with God is not like a a fish barrel, not like a nuclear bunker, but it's like a theater. It's where the, the glory, the beauty is is in the Lord's temple. On the way uh, back from uh, holiday in England uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we stopped by um, probably the the greatest uh, building in in the United Kingdom, which is, of course, Old Trafford. Uh, And uh, I'd not been there for for nearly 25 years, and we were able to go on a a tour. And even just as just as they they were mowing the grass, it was a thrill to be there to see the place where so many wonderful, glorious things had happened. There was no sense of being in a a dark, cramped place there. No, this was the place of of beauty. This was the place of glory, of wonder. And that, for David, is uh, is, is, is what his life with God is. All the joy, all the beauty, all the glory is not, not outside, but it's inside. Inside the shelter, inside the temple, inside the house of the Lord. Because when he came there, he saw the source of all beauty 
the source of all goodness, the source of all joy. And he was able to gaze upon it. See, other things uh, can be good. You have a, a good tree and a good table and a good man. But that is what they, they, ha- they have goodness. Goodness is not what they are. But when we come to God, God is goodness itself. He is beauty itself, joy itself. Everything good that we we experience, whether it's the the deep blue of a tropical sea, whether it's the the first look in a newborn baby's eyes, whether it's the vision of of a beautiful painting, all of the goodness and the beauty we experience in them finds its source in who God is, the divine nature of God. Have you understood who God is like David has? Is this how you think about God? Is God beautiful to you in himself? Is your heart's desire simply to to see him, to contemplate him, uh, to know him? How do you see knowing God? Is it like being asked to get into a a barrel of herring? Or is it being given a ticket to a theater, to a gallery, to see the most beautiful, wonderful thing that you could imagine? See, if all the gospel offers you is is a kind of nuclear bunker, then the gospel cannot take away your fear. You'll always feel that something is, is slipping through your fingers, That somehow your heart is being denied the beauty that it longs for. Because that's what fear is. Fear is the anticipation of of loss. That's why we fear the virus, because it may take away our health or our strength or our loved ones. That's why we fear an endless stretch of lockdowns, because it could take away our job or our friends or our relationships. But the good that David sees, is the Lord and his beauty. And that's why he doesn't have any fear. That's why even as the armies come against me, he says, I will fear no one. Because I know if I can look at the Lord, if I can gaze at the Lord, if I'm in his presence, then I cannot lose anything. Because I have all the beauty, all the goodness that my heart could want. And that's why the place of beauty is the place of safety. That's why beauty is the antidote to fear. As David says in verse 5, For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. Because when you see God in his beauty, you see him in his power and his majesty, what danger can befall you if you have a place in the house of the Lord And so notice that David's response to his rescue isn't simply the the relief of having avoided disaster. It isn't the nervous anxiety of being in the bunker waiting for the all clear or being stuck in the herring barrel waiting for the wagon to come to a stop. Now what David has in in verse 6 is is exuberant, noisy, joyful celebration. At his sacred tent I will sacrifice With shouts of joy, I will sing and make music to the Lord. Because David has found beauty. He's found the pearl of great price, the desire of his heart. He's able in in some small measure to sit and contemplate that which his heart values above all things. And so the question, I suppose, at this point is, how do we see the Lord as beautiful in this way? How do we have a vision of the Lord that changes us in the way that it changed David? Because if we're honest, for many of us, we just can't see it, can we? We read a a verse like verse 4, speaking of the beauty of the Lord, and it reads like someone telling us how delicious celery is, how how tasty it it is to eat celery all day. 
But the reason for that is not because God himself is not glorious, not beautiful, but because in our sinful nature we're colorblind to the technicolor splendor of God. Our ears are are deaf to the majesty of his music. We can't smell the, the savor of his aroma. And so if we're to have freedom from fear in the way that David did, we need to to learn to appreciate God's beauty, to see it, to know it. Of course, one way to do that is to connect uh, the creator to the creation. Uh, Connect the art uh, to the artist to see the beautiful things in the world that he has made and understand uh, that they come uh, from God as as, uh, the maker of them. Of course, another way, perhaps the main way, is to gather together as God's people. What the Bible calls God's true dwelling place, his true temple. Where as we we sing together, as we uh, share the Lord's Supper together, as you hear God's word together, we're trained to see beyond these material and changeable things to the unchanging beauty and goodness of God himself. See, the place of beauty is the place of safety. If we feel afraid in these times, and and of course that is very natural uh, to to feel fear in in one respect or another at these times. But our anxieties have one solution, one antidote, which is to train ourselves to see the Lord for who he is. The place of beauty is the place of safety. Now, having said all of that, David could end the psalm at verse 6. That would uh, make sense. The psalm would move from uh, uh, fear uh, to uh, celebration, uh, from uh, enemies uh, to um, uh, being surrounded by God's people. And, And it would all hang together nicely as a declaration uh, of uh, David's faith. But instead, David continues. And we have this rather uh, anguished prayer in verses 7 uh, to 12. Why is that? Why is it that David uh, begins to to pray this this prayer uh, to the Lord, be merciful to me and answer me? Why is it uh, that he, he does that? Well, it's because if you say verse 4, then you must say verse 8. You see, if the one thing that you seek is to dwell in the house of the Lord, then the one thing you fear is not to find it, not to find the place of beauty, to be turned away and rejected. See, if you say verse 4, then you must say verses 8 and 9. If we know that the dwelling of the Lord is the place of beauty, the question is, can we get there? Will we be received there? And so our second heading is, the place of beauty is the place of acceptance. The place of beauty is the place of acceptance. See, that's where David's fear is now. It's not his enemies or or the lies that his enemies are telling about him or the armies that they're sending against him. His fear is one thing, that the Lord's face might turn against him. See, David is a man of one search and one request and therefore only one fear, that his search for God's presence would prove fruitless. And so in verses 7 to 12, he pleads that God's face not be turned away from him. See, I wonder if that's your deepest fear this morning. In amongst all the others, in amongst all the other anxieties and and worries that touch upon us, underneath we have the fear that eventually, when all is said and done, what we've done and who we are won't be good enough. That the good and the beautiful and the true that we've, we've somehow uh, laid our hands upon in our lives will slip 
through our fingers. And if we allow ourselves a moment's honest reflection, there's a rumble of panic. Because deep down we know that we don't belong in the presence of someone or something so good and so beautiful. People as as morally twisted, as as selfishly inverted as us don't deserve to be in the presence of such beauty. Our our sin stains us. No one is as false as us who deserves to stand in the presence of such truth. No one as ugly as us deserves to be in the presence of such beauty. And so David, in verse 9, sees the issue. How will God deal with a man like him? Do not turn your servant away in anger, he says. But look at what he says in verse 10. In verse 10, he says, He switches from addressing the Lord in the second person and speaks about the Lord in the first. He has one final truth to tell himself as he pleads for the Lord's acceptance. He says in verse 10, Though my my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. I think as I've reflected on this verse, I've changed my mind about how to understand it. I used to think that David was kind of creating a kind of extreme situation, imagining an extreme situation. Imagine how bad things would have to get that even your your mum and dad would shut the door in your face. Well, even in that extreme situation, the Lord will take take you in. But of course, things would have to be pretty bad wouldn't they, for most of us, for even our parents to forsake us. But as I've reflected on, on, on things a bit more deeply, I think the reality is a bit more complicated than that. That lots of us, even when we have a very happy, close relationship with our parents, perhaps even because we have a happy and close relationship with our parents, we have a, a fear that if they, if they really knew us, if they really knew the, the nooks and crannies of our souls, where the dark things are, are hidden, those worst moments, those worst thoughts, then they would turn away from us. We can carry around with us a, a shame, a guilt, feel the need to, to prove ourselves worthy of them, even if we, we never admit that to ourselves, let alone uh, to others. See, by talking about this, uh, this relationship, uh, this, most, uh, this first relationship, this deepest relationship, uh, the Holy Spirit is putting his finger on the very nerve of human psychology, on the very heart of of the human condition. Long before uh, Sigmund Freud, the Holy Spirit knew where our deepest fears lay. And he's saying that whatever burdens of shame, of guilt, of expectation uh, that you carry, no matter how unspoken, unacknowledged, unrealized they are, no matter how deep they lie, you can come into the presence of the Lord and be received. Whatever there is about you that you fear would make your mother and your father avert their gaze, he sees, he knows, and yet he will receive you and embrace you. How is that possible? It's possible because in the beauty of his eternal love, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit agreed that they would bring sinners like David, sinners like you and I, into their presence. 
It's possible because the eternal Son of God, the one who was beauty itself, took on flesh like ours and became ugly so that we could see God's beauty. He would bear our punishment. He would wear our shame. He would be shut out so we could be let in. That's how far God's love was willing to go, not to forsake us. But the Son was willing to be forsaken himself. If you really want to see God's beauty, if you really want to behold his glory like Moses beheld the Lord's glory in Exodus 34, if you really want to be free from the fear that one day you will be shut out, Go see a man wounded and bloody, dying for no other reason than that you would be received in the place of beauty, that you would be welcomed rather than forsaken. And so David ends the psalm with this note of confidence that he will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Because the house of glory, the house of beauty, is also the house of mercy. The house of beauty is the house of welcome. The house of the Lord is a place where the door is always open. Because the place of safety is the place of beauty. And the place of beauty is the place of acceptance. So you and I this morning, and through the Lord Jesus Christ, can come into the place where goodness and beauty and joy itself are to be found. It's almost unbelievable that we would be able to come to the place where our our hearts have always been yearning for and drawing us to. And yet, in the scriptures, in the Lord Jesus, in the, the symbols that we're about to share together, we find that it's true that the Lord is calling us. And so what does David have to fear? What can he lose? The one thing that he seeks, he has. And if the one thing that you seek, the one thing you long for is to gaze on the beauty of the Lord, you can say with David, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these extraordinary truths. We thank you that you have done extraordinary things to rescue people as as ugly and as stained as us, uh, to bring us into your presence through the Lord Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that you would, by your Spirit, uh, place this in our hearts, that we would know that joy, that uh, relief, that, that freedom from fear, Uh, that they would have, uh, and that in these weeks and months to come, uh, that we would uh, have the confidence uh, to wait for you uh, and wait for the day that that our faith is replaced by sight uh, and we see you face to face uh, fully. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.